Thank you. I think that we are okay because I no, can. No, now it's now it's live. Is it? I see. We are already. live and recording now, so. Great. It must be just my screen that is playing up. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our panel discussion today. Um, my name is Amanda Cooper. I am an editor for Markets and Investing at Insider here in the UK. And today we will be discussing eight years to the 2030 goals, a bearish outlook. With me this morning is an absolutely tremendous lineup of guests. Um, we have, uh, in no particular order, we have Ravi Amble, who is chief executive of uh, tele telehealth startup Sukina. We have Carla Chico, who is a board member at Alcatel and has had a long career in uh, international career in consulting and throughout the corporate world. We have Dinesh Demija, who is a founder of the Copper Group, who also is founder of eBookers, has been a minister of the European Parliament and is now channeling his energies into development of, of solar power. We have Lucas de Coipra, who is a founder of Daggio and who is focusing on uh, life sciences and uh, biomedical solutions and so on. Um, we have Bart Turtleboom, who is a veteran of emerging market finance and is chair of Delphos International. Now, we're going to be taking a look, first of all, at what the 20 goals, 2030 goals are. So just as a brief reminder, we are looking at the goals for 2030 are a cut of at least 40 percent in greenhouse gas emissions from 1990 levels, at least a 32 percent share of renewable energy in the generation mix and at least a 32.5% improvement in energy efficiency. These are lofty goals. They are set by politicians. And when they were set and agreed, uh, you know, in, in the past, this was before the uh, invasion of Ukraine that has thrown up a whole host of obstacles to meeting those goals. So today we're going to be talking not just about the setbacks that, that the Ukraine invasion has thrown into the mix, but the setbacks that were there from the get-go. Right. Now, I think to kick us off, um, Carla, I'd like you to perhaps talk through a little bit. You know, you're a you're a, a, a veteran of the business world. If you were faced with uh, you know these goals, someone handed them to you and said, "Make these happen." What kind of response would you have? Well, I will ask the usual the first question: a who is going to foot the bill? This is the first question. Then. Uh, uh, what is going to be the return on investment, meaning if we are going to put this money there, what is going to be the return? And who is going to be accountable for that? And the last question will be really, okay, should maybe we do this money in a, uh, in a different way, in a more practical way? If, but, uh, but as you said, having been set up by politician, this is our just merely goal. And uh, what I can see that uh, there is no, I mean, uh, we are really going uh, untouched by reality because uh, when they set up a goal, of course, it was before Ukraine, but we already knew that we were having, uh, that we could face uh, problem uh, for supply of energy. We knew, I mean, at least uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Italian. So, I mean, Italy is depending from uh, third parties. And uh, instead, for example, to focus on to reach at the global level some, uh, you know, some goals, why each country shouldn't be thinking to be, for example, to build their independency, because the, today has been Ukraine, next time it's going to be other things. And also to dismiss uh, but uh, I mean, let's say traditional source of uh, traditional source of energy as uh, not good for the planet. I think that also this. Uh, I'm not an expert, okay, but I think that also this should be really said carefully. But of course, it's more appealing to to say that, and then uh, to throw the to to throw around then uh, to say, you know, guys. Maybe we could go to back to carbon and um, because there is a technology that is made carbon, uh, you know, a very good source of energy. But, uh, you know, this is one to be so, so charming. So this is my position. I don't think that this is going to be goal that we will meet. Uh, any, anyhow, the question uh, that we, we should answer here, uh, my position is that no. And, uh, and, and I, I will not cry as a citizen if we are not going to meet that. I really, really only wish that uh, uh, that all this uh, international organization and uh, with the political uh, class around the world we really focus on real issues, considering that uh, without uh, taking away the Ukrainian world, 
we have uh, already uh, people suffering from the COVID. And this is a real and uh, present uh, problem. That, that's amazing. There's a few threads that I'd like to pull out there and pass to some of our other panelists. I think your, your issue, firstly, with who pays, who foots the bill. Uh, Dinesh, I know that you've got some thoughts about so the availability of money for attaining lofty goals such as the, the 2030. Amanda, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I must correct you. I wasn't a minister of the European Parliament. I was just a member of Parliament. A member, I'm sorry. And that's all right. Uh, second, the second uh, point is that uh, investment in, I know for a fact, solar energy and wind has brought the price down because of research and development to well below uh, the production of coal. Now, obviously, you don't have wind and solar everywhere in the world. Some, somewhere you have one, somewhere you have the other. But if there wasn't that um, infusion of cash, and it was done by Germany, actually, uh, we would never have had uh, solar and wind being cheaper than coal. Um, I think all the carbon that's already in the atmosphere is there, and actually it's increasing as we use all uh, the fossil fuels that we have. But we haven't yet produced, or we haven't done, uh, a, a, haven't produced a gizmo or, or something that can take carbon out of the air and reduce carbon levels. We're just trying to slow down the atmosphere, um, that carbon in the atmosphere, and because we don't have the technology at the moment. So I think money needs to be put into that. Someone needs to set goals, and these goals, of course, are not uh, written in, in stone. But if we need, to, because we see the scientific effect of heating of the world. So uh, I agree that politicians are certainly not scientists and they just uh, uh, take out some figures and there's a consensus in a meeting. Uh, but I, I just feel that it's a good thing that this has been done. We in Europe, uh, I live in London, we in Europe uh, are actually okay with, with a bit of warming of the planet. But it's the... Um, the, the countries between the Tropic of Capricorn and Cancer uh, are the problems, uh, and, and they are really, really suffering. I know for a fact uh, that my mother, who's 94, lives in Delhi, uh, New Delhi, India, and it is, uh, in the last 10 days, the average temperature has been 45 degrees. So I'll just throw some of these to the rest of the panelists. No, absolutely. I think the issue of sort of incentives for governments to meet these goals is a is a key one. Um, Ravi, did you want to share some thoughts on that? I don't think you heard. Sorry, Ravi. I was saying that that incentives oh, for politicians you. and governments to actually take yeah, the ownership. Sure. And, yeah. You know, just to what Dinesh was alluding to and what Carla was talking about. Very good. Very valid points. Uh, again, it comes to leadership. Uh, it comes to appropriate leadership. You know, what are the short-term plans? What are the long-term plans? Uh, technology is growing at a very fast pace, but is technology being applied to society appropriately? Is that being commoditized? Is it affordable? Those are the questions. If we look at it from the energy standpoint, now, everything that, for example, SpaceX is doing, Amazon is doing in terms of heading towards commercialization of transportation between the Earth and Mars, one of the things that you are, you know, I was li listening to some of the astronauts uh, from NASA, and they're seriously talking about uh, even, you know, Elon Musk and, you know, Jeff Bezos and so on, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, everything that is discrete and continuous manufacturing to be done on Mars, you know, so that you take out the greenhouse effects, so to speak, from the Earth's atmosphere. So if that is the mindset and that is the pace at which that we are going, then how can we substantiate that? Now, if we were to backward chain it, now coming down brass tacks, how do we solve the immediate problems? You know, 
any of the leadership that we take today, not to be political in any form or manner, we need some true blue CEOs to run the countries. Now, put the country in front of you. We want patriots to run individual countries. Every country needs to think about its wellness in all aspects, you know? And one of the things I think we all forget is we don't bring anything into this world. We're not going to take anything from this world when we go away. Let's make the journey really fruitful and productive. Now, I think that's a, a great point that you make about uh, the importance, the central pillar of health and wellness, and how I think you were saying yourself earlier, health is wealth. Um, Lucas, you are uh, your your focus is on the life sciences and healthcare. Uh, you know, what are the uh, you know, we, you know, our, our, the kind of the center of our discussion today is kind of more about the climate fault goals. But those are just one piece of the puzzle, aren't they? Well, I think you're on mute. They, they are. Um, thanks for mentioning that, by the way. Uh, they are. Um, but even though in, um, in life sciences, um, making a, a big contribution to um, sustainability is also possible. Um, in our company, we, we only work with um, sustainable components in, in building uh, our products. Um, because if you look at life sciences, um, in fact, it, it originally comes from uh, the crossing of uh, chemistry and, and biology. And if you go back to uh, how many products today are made, uh, um, it's, 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 it's pure uh, heavy chemistry um, with uh, petroleum uh, fracturing um, to make a lot of the products that, that, that we use today in, in healthcare. Um, I think we all know uh, the, the COVID uh, rapid tests uh, and, and just think about the, the amount of plastic uh, that has been used uh, just to house a single strip. Um, and that's just one example. Eh? If you look at the, um, the outputs, uh, the waste outputs of um, hospitals and the uh, part of that which is difficult to renew also because of biohazards and, and so on. So we, we, we also have to rethink that ecosystem, although the products in themselves are pretty small compared to, for instance, uh, cars or buildings, um, the volume is, 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 very, uh, is very high. Um, and then also coming back to uh, life sciences more um, in general, um, the question is also, okay, um, we set these ambitious goals um, in terms of climate change. Um, whereas we, from a life sciences perspective, see that um, health in the coming decennia is also going to be a huge, a tremendous cost. Um, so how do you align those and where do you put your money? Because there's all, all, only so many that you can spend. OK, you can print additional money, but we all know that that goes back uh, at the later stage um, um, and makes things worse, uh, in fact. So. Where do you spend the money? You have the health uh, dilemma, you have the climate dilemma. Uh, those two are, are connected as well. So um, where do you put the priorities? Uh, yeah. I just want to add one thing to Luke, what Lucas is saying from a healthcare standpoint. We are an aging world. You know, when we, when we get to our last quarter in life, I think every human being deserves to live with dignity and grace. You know? And one of the things, not because I'm focused to long-term care, but one of the things that we need to really channel from a healthcare standpoint is how we can have a global resource that can be used where it is needed in any given socioeconomic healthcare demography. Two, so we need to really seriously look at building very beautiful, affordable long-term care facilities across the globe. You know, because when, when we are, you know, in, just to speak about the United States, 80% of our healthcare costs is in palliative care, last 60 days of life. And our healthcare bill crossed $4 trillion, annual healthcare bill crossed $4 trillion last year. Uh, you know, our GDP has dropped by more than 1.8%, probably 2% by now. And, you know, if you are spending a dollar out of every five, if 20% of our healthcare costs is going to be rather 20% of our healthcare costs is, you know, 20% of our GDP, uh, you know, uh, uh, where are we going? 
and and the world over the challenges are different but the commonality is you know how can we access you know uh quality health care that's affordable on demand absolutely i think two two themes that kind of keep popping up and i'm going to turn over to bart in a minute are money who pays how do you allocate the resources and the need for a global effort now in the in the uh bart my question to you is that you know all this is somewhat at odds with the push towards deglobalization that we're seeing now how does this um how uh, you know this uh, how do we how do we marry the two how do we bring governments and people and communities on board to work together and to pay for all of this well thank you very much for um the invitation to this panel and and you you just hit upon something and it's sort of been a current underlying what our friends on the panel have been discussing and that is the tension between on the one hand the uh, 2030 goals and the deglobalization that we're witnessing and there is a lot we do not know but there are a couple of things we kind of can be reasonably sure about and the first one is the 2030 goals are global goals if we want to achieve them or make progress to achieve them we need a global effort and if we need a global effort we need a global governance structure and the global governance structure can only come about if nation states um push that agenda and there obviously the rubber is meeting the road and i would make a couple of observations coming back to to what has been said be first first and foremost we might be deluding ourselves that people care about this maybe they care about inflation if you're living in ukraine you most certainly don't care about it so in other words there are a set of factors that uh we need to ensure that we get to a point where a consensus is building that this is indeed worth spending the money on and the only way we're going to be able to spend the required money on it which is clearly not billions clearly not hundreds of billions but is trillions is the only way you're going to get to spend a trillion if you ask for a trillion so we should stop asking for an increase in the world bank budget of 5 billion for xyz or 10 billion here or there it's irrelevant it doesn't matter we need to be us driving this agenda we need to be much more ambitious in uh, achieving those goals i want to finally make one point coming back to the governance on um that this does not seem to be very high off up on the agenda of politicians that there is a disconnect between politicians and the population uh the only observation i will make on that is that there seems to be little evidence of the approach to that there is a different approach to particularly climate change and sustainable infrastructure between more democratic and less democratic regimes i think the jury is very much out on that Absolutely. Okay, I'm I'm going to throw this next question to I think to Dinesh and Carla just taking into account your respective backgrounds in politics and in business and investment. Uh the availability of the money. Bart says if you ask for a trillion the only way you get a trillion is if you ask for a trillion, not if you ask for a billion. Why aren't we asking for a trillion? Yep. But the problem is that uh, at the end of the day it seems that you know of course you can print money because at the end of the day how you're going to get that, okay? because uh, and you just mount uh, the debt that each country has and then you know then they want but i think that the bottom line is really the allocation of resources and to be more no <coughs> to to be a little bit on the back to the reality and again is not just to be sure that i'm against absolutely you know alternative source of energy what i want to say is that uh, we need to have i mean to focus and to put the money where really we can have really concrete result and where it's showing that if because in a in a executive word if, if you invest one $1 you have to show what is the return on investment of this $1 and and there is no accountability here now uh, there was a question that i think uh, that every i think that most of the people are asking themselves because uh, if you speak you know in time of election everywhere they say oh you know maybe don't go to vote because in any case this, nobody really understand what is happening here anybody i think that the problem today is that uh, that uh, while uh, that uh, to become a politician is not just uh, at the end of uh, an alternative career or to bring your experience that you don't want has become in a career okay 
and I don't want to go into detail and to spend, but just becoming a career. Personally, I think that anybody who is going to the political arena should at least know and know how to read the balance sheet. Okay, because I and or to have the experience to go and to say, okay, every three months, or even if you are in Paraguay every year, I have to show to somebody, whether it's going to be family or or investors or the market in general, I have to show that I have done that properly. So you will you will take really care of any penny that you're going to discuss because what politicians are doing now is just to put the burden to the private sector. So we are talking about a lot of, you know, uh, private and public sector. No, at the end of the day, who is going to pay the bill is always the private sector. Therefore, each of any of us. I have to just point out, we've had a great comment from Amelia Lopez of MCI Partners, who's uh, joining us in the audience today, and she's put in the comment box, it is also about implementing the targets and allocating resources based on results and impact on development, which harkens back to your point, Carla. And in that sense, she says, there is a problem of capability that needs to extend beyond the UN. So here we move out of the political arena and into the real world. Dinesh, what are your thoughts here? Well, um, I, I think I agree with most of what Carla said, except one. We need to do a lot of research and development. And for that, we do not know how, how much, much, you know, what will come out of it. As I mentioned earlier, we need to take carbon out of the atmosphere. We need to invent something that can do that. There are a lot of companies trying to do that, but we need to put a lot more money into this. And the ROI or the return on investment for that cannot be uh, calculated. So, um, so there has to be some uh, money put into, a lot of money actually, put into research and development. I mean... Mark Carney, during COP in Glasgow, said he can raise $130 trillion for climate change. And, of course, there weren't many details on it because are these tied funds or are they, you know, that you can allocate these funds across the globe, et cetera, et cetera. But my point, which I made earlier in a closed session, was that India said that they will get to net zero by 2070. And you're talking about 1.4 billion people here. And China said they'll get to um, net zero by 2060. And you're talking about 1.44 billion people, which is 40%, both India and China, 40% of the world population. If they're saying 60 and 70, how are we talking 50, 2050, or, or what are the goals? So, so these are all stretch targets that have been put. But if Mark Carney can raise that money or someone like him, um, as I was saying, give me a trillion dollars and I'll sort, uh, I can get India done with a, with a free hand by 2040. It's not a big deal, you know, uh, because solar and wind are cheaper than coal. What's the big deal? That's where's, yeah, where's the hold up? I just wanted to, I want to bring Lucas into this. We were talking about kind of the reality on the ground, the real economy. Lucas, you were talking earlier about the very real problems of global supply chains and, you know, making the shift to better, more efficient technology. But that's difficult to do if you have elements like physical blockages of that, that you can't get the copper from one end of the world to the other or the semiconductor chips. What do we do about that? Exactly. So um, in order to get to these goals, we need a lot of uh, technological innovations and we need a lot of technology on the ground and to get that technology on the ground of course we're going to need a lot of uh, microchips we're going to need a lot of precious metals that go into the microchips and go into a lot of technology uh, products um, apart from all of the other uh, natural resources that we need in order to create um, these technologies and, and and these products that help us with um, the, the the climate uh, transition now if you see uh, the disruptions that we get nowadays in uh, global supply chains uh, with uh, the COVID, uh, the, the evergreen that um, got stuck in the Suez Canal, if you look now at the Ukraine crisis where we see a, a disruption in supply chain, uh, it's, a, it's a political disruption, uh, but it's a disruption anyways where we um, disrupt our energy uh, supplies. 
energy again um, is the main component of all production. So that again uh, limits um, your tech, your, uh, your pace of technology, your pace of uh, production. So all of these things together make uh, sure that um, it gets uh, pretty expensive once you get one of these uh, supply chains uh, that gets uh, disrupted. Make your final products. And in the world that we uh, live today, where everything is so interconnected and supply chains uh, are on such a, a tight uh, string, um, one disruption here can lead to a disruption in an entire ecosystem. And my feeling is that um, with that happen, with that potential of that happening, and it is happening, um, we are actually getting further away from the goals than than closer. Um, rising prices because of uh, these supply chain issues lead to a large uh, part of the population who cannot longer participate. So if they cannot participate, how can we then expect them to make a contribution towards uh, these goals? Um, and also from a politician uh, per perspective, um, if we want to end, uh, well, and then I'm looking at the, the, the first uh, seven to eight goals. Yeah, they um, uh, we're moving away from that. Uh, two of the things I would like to add to what Lucas is talking about is very important. One is hydrogen and one is nuclear energy. If you take France, France is all nuclear energy. And the reason why nuclear energy has not been commercialized is maybe because of politics. Uh, you know, the Ukraine, the war with Ukraine opened up a Pandora's box. Uh, our vulnerability and reliance on petroleum when we have alternative sources of energy that has been around for the longest time. Every house can be powered by nuclear energy and it is extremely safe. Now, I think, no, thank you for that. I wanted to just point out, um, Benjamin Butler, who is an independent futurist strategist, has popped a comment in there for you, Dinesh. He said he loved your comments. And he says, a good friend of mine said that we already have a great technology which takes carbon out of the air. It's called a tree. I think that many futurist colleagues of mine focus on technology, but I think we need to recarbonize nature. And this also helps the biodiversity crisis and the sixth extinction. I think we habitually underestimate the genius of nature. No, uh, Benjamin's totally right that the tree is, 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 is one of the best forms. The only thing is it takes a long time to, uh, to, to take this out. We don't have that time. Of course, we need to plant more trees. I'm not saying don't plant them. I just want to give you two points, Amanda, uh, which uh, I know because I'm in the energy business. Uh, energy price was 60 euros per, me per megawatt before the Ukraine war. It is now 220 euros per megawatt. It's over three times price. Second point, fertilizer prices, because most of the fertilizers were coming from Ukraine and Russia to the rest of Europe, were, were 200 euros per metric ton. Now they're 2,200 euros per metric ton. So, I mean, I can't see that in the inflation figures. I can't see that anywhere, but it's got... A, and someone was saying yesterday, I was at a conference, that the recession that's coming is an energy recession, and that's about it. It's nothing else but energy, as, as uh, uh, was pointed out by Lucas earlier, is used in everything, and that's what's fueling everything else uh, in, in price rises. Oh, absolutely. We're seeing that knock-on effect. Um, I, uh, Lucas and Ravi, you were talking about um, the, the, the sort of political divisions that the war in Ukraine has thrown up. Ravi, you called it a Pandora's box that reveals the vulnerability and, and fragility of sort of the, 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 you know, this, the energy supply and energy security and so on. I wanted to pass a question over to Bart. Um, you know, I think you were sort of saying earlier that, that, that if this crisis has highlighted one thing is that the kind, that kind of sense of common global good has disappeared. Um, how do we get that back? That is an incredibly intriguing question that you're asking. And, and, and I don't really have a good answer to it, except that we do have one recent episode where the sort of broader development uh, related also to emerging markets and poorer countries 
did become part of a global agenda that had global support. And that was the post-collapse of the Soviet Union and the integration of China in uh, the world economy. These were two enormous developments over the past uh, 30 years that really led to integration of uh, trade flows, financial flows, and the global market for human capital. Now, what we're experiencing now is that there are political limits and the, the distributional aspects of that improvement in productivity um, have become very nefarious, and we are now having putting the we've now put the gear in reverse. How do we go, put it back? It's you know, it's I'm not, I, I'm not sure, and I, I want to sort of pose one question to the panel. Let's say that tomorrow somebody invite invents a funnel that costs one U.S. dollar that sucks all the carbon out of the atmosphere. The problem is gone. Who controls the funnel? And who has what incentive to control the funnel? And who is going to have the interest uh, to have uh, something that only costs one euro or one dollar? Because at the end of the day, it's and, 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 and we, we have certainly seen people buying patents over the past 20, 30 years that produce carbon intensive energy to make sure that these patents don't see the light of day. So, to your point, Carla, I agree with you. But, Amelia, but can Mark, I jump in? I'm sorry. It could be a $130 trillion question. <laughs> question Anyhow, is, who gets, it? who gets it? I think that, uh, you know, just to, to, just to complete and to follow up of what Bart just said, first of all, it has been our illusion, and when I say our means the West illusion, that in the last 30 years we were, for example, incorporating China into other world. It's never been, the, it's never ex- it's never happened, it's not going to happen, okay? So we have to keep this very clear. China is China, and, and then there is the rest of the world. This is how they see what is happening. I mean, this is how they see the, the world. And I can say this because I've been living in China for many years. I speak Chinese, and so I, I quite not understand what I'm thinking. And, uh, you know, I don't want now go into the Russia issues and Ukraine issues because, to frankly speaking, it will be very difficult. I don't think that is this, the team of here. But what has been really, the, my question is that, uh, I mean, uh, talking about the fact that now that uh, uh, Dinesh said, you know, that we need to have a lot of, uh, you know, investment in R&D to find alternative source or, or, or source of energy. But uh, Ravi said something that, is absolutely, absolutely true. We have nuclear energy, completely safe, and in some countries, including, for example, Italy, we have not, we, we have not built that for, between brackets, green reason, safety reason, when this is a really a misleading, inform, misleading information, misleading information because France among uh, the European country, or anything that I know, they are more independent. So why that? So I'm not saying that you don't have to invest, but the point is that you have to invest again in a proper, uh, and having, having in front of you, what is going to be the result? Everything that you invest had to be marketable. Otherwise, you don't invest in that things. So it's not good, I'm not saying, but I mean, and then I really would like to understand how people can write three trillion, I mean, people threw away uh, figures, you know, 300 people, last but not the least. When you have a business plan that is, go, that is going more than three years, you can say, okay, everything after three years is absolutely irrelevant. And this is go, this is goes for a corporation and it goes for a country and overall for the over for the uh, overall now again i'm talking about the uh, the western the western world because we know that a lot of things can happen but also how we are go- who is going to impose and to structure that i mean it's useless that we are, of course, China is uh, you know is getting uh, is getting there because they can impose things so here we go again. We are going to dwell. What is going to be the best political environment 
you know, because we want everything. We want uh, to, to eat the cake and to have the cake. We want democracy and we want then and we want result. We want to get there, but then nobody's going to be accountable. We want to make everybody happy, but then at the end of the day, nobody's happy. I really would like to, I really would like to do some referendum now and I really would like to understand what people really want today. And I'm sure that the answer will be very simple. They want economy stability. They want a very good health healthcare system because people because the people are. Be, I mean, we are uh, you know becoming older all the time. That's all. So, do we have this answer here? The answer are to think how we are going to have the planet in uh, 30 years from now. Maybe I don't know. Why don't we do right. a referendum? I'm I, sure. uh... Can I make a follow-up um, statement on that? Um, I think indeed it's about um, political accountability and uh, in a way that uh, we see this now in many European countries is um, the shift. And, and I'm coming back to the to the core uh, point of the discussion around the electric cars and the availability of the of the materials to, to, to build them. So I see that the narrative in electric cars is slightly changing. Um, so it used to be zero emission vehicle. Now I see in the latest uh, adverts, it's zero local emission uh, vehicle because, yeah, the emissions are, of course, not where the car is, but they are somewhere else. And if you see now um, some European countries resorting back to gas, uh, resorting back to coal, I mean, we're, we're, we should hold the, the politicians accountable for that. As a citizen, you are getting taxed for putting CO2 emissions out of the back end of your car. Uh, and so you get incentivized if you drive an electric car. I think we should uh, do the same with politicians. If they open a, goal, uh, a coal or gas central, they should get taxed personally on that. Whereas they open a nuclear power plant, gas, uh, sorry, wind, uh, solar, they should get an incentive. So why not do it like in business with performance-based uh, remuneration? If I may, Luca, one of the things uh, uh, on a satirical note, but a very serious satirical note, I wonder what the personal compensation of each politician is on this planet. <laughs> I really don't know. Well, I, I wonder how long for a joint attack on, on politicians. Not that I'm one anymore. But I just, <laughs> I just, I just, I just, yeah. no pun intended. No, no. I, I, let, let, let me also point out one or two other things. Um, in India, uh, the standard of living, the per capita income is around about two and a half thousand dollars. Uh, or, or, or about three trillion dollars of GDP, so it's two and a half thousand dollars per person, right? In the states, it's sixty thousand. In India, there are many, many people in the millions. I think four hundred million who don't have running water or electricity. All right, we need to get the. So they will need a lot more energy in the future. They will need, of course, they're going into solar and wind in a big way, but they need to increase the coal-powered plants for the energy needs, unfortunately. So there's, there's a lot that the West doesn't see that's happening in the East or in, in underdeveloped countries. And I have family living in India, and I'd like them to have the same standard of living as me here. So the West needs to know, hang on, they've developed over the last 50, 100 years, put a lot of emissions into the atmosphere. Now these other countries are going to be putting emissions into the atmosphere. And we've got to, and, and, and as it, it's got to be global, uh, you know, but as Bart said, so that is the big problem at the moment. So that's why India and China don't sign up to any of the goals. It's not because they're, they, 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 they're different or, or, or they're, they're that they are uh, and not happy. It's just that they want to be equal. That's all. Yeah, Dish, uh, I, to, to your point, um, it's a very interesting point. And, and I think we have to see that indeed separately as, 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 two, uh, as three different parts of the world. Yeah. Uh, but the frustration I think uh, that, 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 that I have is that we in the West go back 50 years uh, now and kind of try to uh, argument um, for ourselves that uh, having gas and coal mines are good be because we can do it in a different way and we should give the example and say look 
we are 20, 30 years ahead in that uh, development. So look at, we can maintain it. And another point that um, was popping, uh, popping in my head when we were discussing this is um, another thing that I think we should try to avoid is uh, this whole uh, discussion around emission rights and just buying clean air from another country. That is uh, completely idiotic. Uh, it's, um, we have a saying here that says, if everybody cleans in front of his own uh, house, the whole street is clean. But I have never seen that where they say, yeah, but my neighbor will clean two times, so I don't have to clean. So that doesn't work. So instead of saying, ah, but we have bought from some exotic island where there is no pollution at all, so many cubic uh, kilometers of clean air, so now we can pollute a little bit more here. That's completely uh, uh, crazy in, in, in a way. So um, I think that's that sort of mathematical uh, solutions uh, we need to try to avoid that because every time at the end of the year if there is some uh, general assembly and the politicians are held accountable they come up with these mathematical inventions. So i just want to give you one one example when i was in the eu parliament um, mr modi was coming to see ursula van der Leyen, and there was a big opposition for mr modi to come by one party and this party, and I won't name the party, this party said uh, they are great emitters of CO2 uh, and we will not allow, there will be a vote and we will not vote against him meeting Ursula van der Leyen. So I went up and found out that India's emissions, total versus global emissions, was 7%, while the EU emissions were 9% globally, Right. So I went to this party and I said, look, India has nearly three times the number of people, but the emissions are also lower than Europe. And then the party said, oh, no, we're not, we were not really talking about CO2 emissions. We were talking about social justice in the country. So there are politicians like that, too. Shifting goalposts. Okay, yes. everybody, we've, we've got three more minutes left of our session. I, th I, know, I feel like we could probably talk for another hour. But given the time we have left, I just wanted to say very briefly, um, I pose you all one question. And if you could, if you could possibly answer it in one minute, no, maybe 30 seconds or less, that would be very grateful. And the question is this, do we forget about 2030? Do we forget about getting to the meeting those goals by 2030? Or do we look at 2030 as a starting point? Um, but I'm going to start with you. You've got 30 seconds. Let's treat it like a starting goal to sustainable path to achieve it. Okay, great. Well, that was, that was five seconds. That was great. Lucas? I think it's a matter of uh, aim for the stars. And in that regard, uh, let's keep it where it is. Fantastic. Carla? I will revive that. He can be a starting point, but definitely needed to be a very deep revision, a more realistic revision. Thank you. Ravi? Uh, let us be optimistic, very progressive, and look at 23 as a cornerstone. Okay, thank you. Dinesh? Um, stretch goals are very important because that's the only time you can innovate. Otherwise, it's lateral thinking and not geometric, geometric progression. You can see in technology, things are moving geometrically. They are just going up like, like a hockey stick. So we need to have stretch goals. But I agree with the other panelists. But let's hope for the best. Thank you. Well, you've, you've all been amazing. We've got 30 seconds less. I can't, I cannot thank the, the five of you enough for this incredibly interesting, insightful and thought provoking conversation this morning. Thank you also to our audience for your amazing questions, thoughts and comments and for tuning in. And I think with that, we've got a couple more seconds to go. So I'll wish you all a very good rest of the day, a good rest of the week. Enjoy other panels that you take part in. And I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you very, Bye -bye. Much. very, much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.